If I had to run the 100 meter dash against Usain Bolt, he'd probably beat me even in a wheelchair. I'm bringing this up because this is really what it feels like when you are just getting started with Joe Bavalon. Your opponents are gonna be dropping like flies in a perfect domino effect. However, once you climb the rating ladder a little bit, they will occasionally start playing a very challenging line. Let me show you what I mean. So first of all, it's worth knowing that this idea can happen from a variety of move orders. Essentially is when black plays the bishop onto f5. If you've been watching the channel, you already know that uh, we play f3 and it starts raining with pawns. They're gonna be doing uh, whatever we push and here they have a choice between going h6 but the more challenging approach is pushing the pawn all the way to h5 which to a lot of people this is just their kryptonite simply hitting a wall not being able to make any progress big but luckily for you i decided to use my unmatched perspicacity to craft some game-changing ideas not only against this specific variation but additionally, how to play against the very annoying c5 on move 2. And more so, by the end of this video, you will have a complete guide on how to beat the penalty as well. Enjoy! Alright everybody, getting another white game. Let's try... Uh, our little Jubaf of London and Nokia opening goes d5, which is by far the most common thing that I expected to face. Either this or the knight to f6. And... Yeah, normally would be expecting this. I'm not surprised that he plays bishop to f5 because they tend to do this thing kind of regularly for some reason, which is, uh, yeah, not the most theoretical thing ever. Nevertheless, we're going to be sticking with the Jubaf of London. And in case he plays the move knight c6, this is going to get very interesting. Oh, never mind. He is just playing a6. Still, the main idea on knight to c6 is that you have the option of uh, dealing with this uh, annoying thing that's usually going knight b4, attacking c2 by playing the move e4, which is like super unexpected. But the point is that after d5, black doesn't really have a good retreating square for the knight and white is much better. He plays the move a6, which is very logical though, stopping knight to b5. Uh, I'm just going to play e3, expecting either of the knights to develop. And because we see the uh, bishop onto f5, we are going to be playing uh, f3. I could have played f3 on the previous move uh, as well. It's just that uh, here, because he has no knight onto f6, uh, the pawn push is totally fine, but I think he's just a little more precise to do it this way. Um, play z6. I'm saying it can be a bit more precise because... Uh, let's say if you were to play uh, f3 right away and imagine black goes e6, bishop back, uh, h6, e3. Maybe he could play bishop e7 and it's not very easy to defend the h4 pawn uh, because, you know, the knight is like no longer on f6 blocking this idea. Not an issue, but uh, yeah, this is just my thinking process there. And against normal move e6, just gonna launch the pawn push. Usually for them, it's a little more precise to answer f3 with this. So that on g4, they can go right away onto h7. However, after a move like bishop to d3, I still like white's position with very similar ideas. Um, targeting the bishop, only move to retreat. We're gonna be going h4. Um, yeah, this is by far one of the most common themes for... Uh, 1100 and we're threatening to win the piece and I'm super glad that we actually get to deal with what I believe to be the trickier approach because with the last move they are threatening a stakes on g4 and a lot of people may be getting somewhat confused or perhaps just because they tend to autopilot and play the move bishop d3 thinking oh okay we get to trade that go 92 castle you have to realize they just want to take this pawn. So first, go g5. Hit the knight. Then, go for the normal play with bishop d3. Expecting them to go mainly to d7. Knight to g8 is not completely silly. Like the knight maneuvers to e7, maybe f5. Uh, I think that's also kind of like a solid setup for black. Uh, but what would be very odd, knight h7. That's not a good move. The knight is just running out of squares there. 
we see the most common move, just gonna go for the bishop trade. Always taking it with the queen in this structure. It is the easiest thing by far because we're simply preparing to castle along uh, very soon. He is already more or less forced to take because let's say ignoring it with a move like knight c6 allowing the double pawns can be catastrophic after queen d3 and he already needs to uh, rely on desperate measures such as you know king to f7 which is you know not a very nice thing to do uh, because he's losing uh, the right to castle so gonna do knight to castle and one idea that is very critical and a lot of people may be overlooking in this structure when they play h5 and you have pawn on g5, you can actually even go ahead and push g6. And the idea with g6 is not only that, uh, you know, it may appear that our main hope is so that they can take. And the queen comes in, they have to play king e7, and this just looks like a disaster. But even against a move like f6 or f5, you still have very good chances to break through with e4. Uh, generally, I think g6 is great whenever you can play it, and I'm going to do it. Additionally, uh, sometimes it could be better to play knight to long castle and just act normal. But in my experience, that happens very rarely. So I'm going to stick with the uh, evergreen move, just going g6 and hoping he plays one of the more stubborn uh, ideas, like stubborn defense with f6 or f5 but anyways once you get the g6 push if his position was a table now it feels like it has a weak leg therefore making the whole situation super wobbly doubly because taking would really not be making it a fair game and he tries to move c4 it's pretty much saying at this point that if we move the queen he's gonna take and we can no longer recapture which is a very fair argument but he may have forgotten that this move is intermezzo. I mean, in fact, he didn't forget because he had it pre-move. But we still uh, got kind of what we wanted. And on c4, even though we have uh, options here, queen can go back onto this diagonal too. As a rule of thumb, always your queen gets attacked, go back to d2. And that should be okay. Please, bishop e7, threatening this pawn. Now... If I were to play knight e2, allowing bishop takes an h4 with check, I don't like that position because uh, our coordination has to suffer. But I don't mind giving up the pawn as long as, you know, we have a safe king. I think it's better for us to rather to not have that h pawn than to try to play a defensive move. Like, I think a lot of people may perhaps have considered something to defend the pawn. No, losing that pawn, I think it's beneficial because... Potentially the rook is going to be very effective and going to complete my development with knight e2. Uh, I could also consider to be a bit more flexible with e4, saying that in case he takes, I may benefit from the fact that we can play knight f3 or knight h3, knight g5. So if I'm like super obsessed with this, I could do e4. I'm just going to keep it simple though, because I know some of you tend to start with a knight and you ended up uh, with it there. When it comes to long castling or playing knight ge2 when you have these options, I think both moves are equally good. I couldn't really come up with a defense why one would be better than the other. Uh, and yeah, I noticed top level players also, it's, it's a mix. So I think it doesn't really change uh, much. He's going back, which is very natural and strong move. Maybe once g5, but even when he plays that, he's going to be overextending, so... You want to go for e4 break. Remember, when you push g6, e4 break. Threatening to win a pawn, so more or less forcing him to take, I guess, or move this knight. If he moves the, this knight, I can even uh, go ahead and furthermore push with e5. That would be a very nice move. Gaining space, forcing the bishop back. This is pretty much... Uh, gonna come on the next moves like more or less for sure okay he plays b5 saying i'm gonna give you free pawn i mean that's a very kind offer i could really go ahead and take it but i'm gonna play a3 i don't want free pawn I, I want to keep this game a little bit more interesting so he plays knight b6 defending okay that's what i wanted to see 
And we're going to go ahead and play either e5. I'm going to start with this. Staying a bit more flexible. Maybe keep some options. But pretty much, I think, e5, uh, it's guaranteed to be played. Bishop has to drop back. And then one idea could be bishop g5, exchanging bishops. Another thing you can consider maneuvering the knight, but I think simply bishop trade is uh, very fair. Maybe queen f4 check can be annoying to deal with. If he takes, uh, that's even better for us because we're getting a lot of tempo moves, like attacking the pawn. He's helping us to gain a little bit of speed to double up. And uh, yeah, on b4, I can already go consider going counter-attacking mode. But I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to take since there is no fretting coming after. And now I think we just double up. Has to play uh, like rook g defending. I can bring the queen. Then take the g7 pawn. That seems to be a very easy cleanup. I could also consider uh, infiltrating with the knight or something. Uh, he plays rook h7 which is maybe a little bit better. Yeah we're going to bring more pieces. Knight f4. Targeting h5, but uh, creating also kind of like a hidden idea with queen g2, making room to triple. So, yeah, knight h5 could be very strong. In fact, I don't think he had a way to defend after knight h5, but I want to bring the queen over. Flattening this, expecting maybe queen f8. Maybe. Oh, he goes all the way to g8. Let's go knight h5. Reinforcing this idea. I could have started Queen G4. Perhaps uh, that may have been a little bit more precise. But now besides uh, the obvious capture, we also have a bit of a hidden idea. So you can try to pause the video and find it. Hopefully we will get to show it uh, on the board. I'm not like super thrilled about taking with the Rook there because that's going to give him an endgame. But I think there is something better that's waiting for us. So let's see if he's going to allow it. I think best move for him is knight d7. Where I'm probably going to go queen g4. Trying to come a bit closer. Maybe check. Maybe pick up the pawn. We have all the control in the world here. Let's see. Spending a bit of time. And now pause the video. Find a move. Because we can win after knight f6. Little uh, pin going over there. <laughs> Queen has to move, uh, just pick up the rook. He can check, but I can move. I can also block, so no need to panic just yet. Oh, never mind. Uh, I am checking him, so he cannot move that. Time to panic. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm gonna go even this far and be very precise with a check, because now I can go for this. Forcing his king onto the seventh, and now Notice these pieces. Don't take that because it's defended. But simply go for the queen. And the rest is pretty simple. Gonna get a new queen. And I think this turned out to be quite an instructive moment there. Sacrificing the uh, h4 pawn. And... Just the way our initiative uh, played out is as natural as the smile of a newborn baby. Or at least that's... <laughs> they, they use this analogy in chess books. So, <laughs> uh, okay. He resigns. Key takeaway. Go for g6. Okay, very important move. Uh, we can check it with a computer here. Uh, yeah, you can see g6 top line. Usually it is that way. Um, and more stubborn defense would be like f5 in general. But still, you can go like knight e2 castle and break with e4. Um, from my experience, that is quite crushing. So, yeah. Please remember to answer h5 with g5. And with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. Alright, everybody getting another white game. This time facing an 1150. Plays d5. Lots of d5. So we see that... As long as we climb a little bit of uh, rating, they start playing a little bit more standard. Like a lot of d5, uh, specifically. I'm going to go bishop to f4. 
This is the main position of the Jubaba London. When you're playing the white pieces, that's pretty much uh, what you sign up for. If you decide to pick up this opening into your repertoire. And here, black has a choice between a lot of moves. And he plays the move a6, okay, which is very reasonable. They are just uh, trying to stop our little cheese here with knight b5 and takes. That is not the only thing that we play for, but it's, you know, a nice thing to uh, have kind of uh, in the back of your mind. Plays a6, uh, important here to usually start with e3 before knight f3. The opening in itself is pretty easy, but the move orders are the main thing that uh, you want to focus on. So we start with e3. If bishop f5, we're pretty much playing like a chameleon. We're waiting for that so we can play f3. That's why uh, you're not starting knight f3, because if bishop f5, you can no longer be a chameleon. So who doesn't want to be a chameleon? I mean, just imagine how cool is that? Um, you go anywhere unnoticed. Maybe you're already doing that. I'm clearly doing it. So, <laughs> bishop to g4, targeting the queen. This is the position where it's kind of easy to freak out as white. Uh, because, well, you think, oh, let me do bishop, let me block, or let me develop knight. No, 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 we don't do that here. Why would you play that when you can just stick with the main job of a pawn storm? F3 targeting the bishop, and in a nutshell, what this accomplishes is losing a tempo for black so this is a pretty bad because um, we get to play f3 h4 and compared to the normal lines he doesn't even have e6 on the board which can cause a blunder and we may see it because after g5 they go knight d7 and because he has this inferior version the pawn is not defended so important that uh, on h5 you remember to push all right don't make a common beginner fuck up here Bishop d3, allowing takes, and then you lose a pawn. Please. Uh, g5, he has to go to g8 now. But yeah, a lot of them are going to be missing this thing. Okay, do I want to, like, punish him? That's, like, obviously the best move and what you should be playing. But I'm just going to stick with bishop to d3. I think for the sake of getting a more standard position and try to outplay him using the basic plans rather than, uh, you know, being a, a very mean person and take his free pawn. Okay, I mean, opponent knows g6. He knows that we are threatening this, but he he doesn't know there is a hanging pawn. Fine. We'll play around that for, uh, for a little, you know? <laughs> Let's try to act like there is not a free pawn. As I mentioned in the past on the channel, when you don't punish them or when you don't, don't take a pawn, in beginner's brain, usually this is just you know, like immortal. Why would you even defend it? Uh, so, okay, c5, I'm gonna stick with simple play, castle. I'm not afraid of c4 because we just slide back the queen. A lot of people may be a little bit claustrophobic at first with the queen, thinking, oh, I mean, the queen has only one square, I'm afraid not to lose my queen. Don't. <laughs> Simply don't. How, how about that? Queen is fine. E6. Finally, he defends the pawn. And finally, we get, I think, a very common position. I'm super glad that we didn't collect the pawn. I think this has potential to become very instructive. I can go ahead and play e4. That's probably a little bit better. Uh, because we're putting pressure on the center and it's kind of forcing him to move the knight. And then it gets a bit ugly for him. You have bishop e5 and so on to punish. I kind of would love him to go this and castle short. Because there are a lot of very interesting idea that, ideas that I want to show. Uh, these positions, to be honest, are usually slightly preferred uh, for black, according to the computer. Uh, but if you do a little bit more deeper analysis, I think computer realizes it's even. And... In a practical game, I think, in fact, it's very dangerous uh, for black to play with these pawns because whenever you castle, there are ideas to sack the knight. Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to get to show that in this specific game, but uh, it's something to keep in mind on when you have this structure. I'll show you one potential idea after the game. 
So bishop goes back to a5. I think now we play e4. There is really no other move here. Threatening this. And next queen e3 is usually typical uh, improvement. Just, you know, it's not a lot, but it's honest work. And pinning, maybe threatening this. So uh, yeah, don't make the mistake to take twice because that's, uh, you're saying goodbye to your queen. But instead, yeah, I think this is still very viable. He does castle. It's just a bit annoying because the bishop is still here, not allowing like the typical ideas. I would love to somehow show that idea. I'm going to start queen e3. I think he needs to play like knight c6, b5, b4 to get some counterplay. But actually, I may still be able to go knight g3, knight e2, and then do the knight sack. If we get to show that, I am more than happy. Okay, I have only one dream in life to show you that idea. So hopefully, uh, we're going to be able to play it. Unless he last minute decides to take this knight. Knight to b6. Uh, Defending the pawn, well, yeah, that's kind of a must. He had to play it. Now, because knight b6, you may also consider uh, infiltrating, but I want my, I want my little idea. And usually, you'll notice that the king is pretty safe. Um, preparing knight e2. So, ah, damn it! This guy really took on c3 last minute. He edged me so hard. I was, you know. <laughs> It was all going well, and then last minute, you know. <laughs> You're on a date with a girl, and she tells you, oh no, I have to leave, my brother called me, or whatever. <laughs> oh man, this is so bad. I was just like so thirsty to take and bring the other night over. But I'm gonna show you after the game how that, uh, whatever, I think, played out. Uh, okay, knight to d7. Let's refocus. Uh, hmm. This is kind of like a nice move, bishop c1, to have it nicely around the king. If you go bishop d6, e5, you're kind of like planting the bishop, but then the bishop may become a target. So I think it's giving you a false impression that you are getting active. Just like my opponent gave me a false impression that I'm going to get the sacrifice. Uh, knight a4, just going to move the queen. If you play it on b4, once again, it's the typical... Uh, weak-minded move, thinking I attack the knight, but then your queen is gonna be a target to his pawns. So, go to, I think, e3 instead. e1, also interesting. d2 is bad because he has c3. So, e3 or e1. Not sure which one is better. I'm just gonna play queen e3. I'm not having a lot of time uh, remaining on the clock. I may wanna... Yeah, this makes no threat. I want to do this, potentially infiltrating. I think that's a cunning idea that he has potential to forget about. C3, not doing much because of simply B3. And knight B2, it's like, once again, the knight feels active, I can just move the rook. The knight is, like, genuinely trapped. Okay, I mean, I can also take the free pawn. So, yeah, like, knight B2, it's not maybe that good because he has knight back. So, knight B2, I just have to take it. But I don't have to take the b2 pawn. I can try to use it as an umbrella pawn. So I'll probably stick with my knight h5 g6 plan. My evil plan! Trying to play for a checkmate. Okay, queen to b5 doing uh, absolutely nothing, I guess. Uh, yeah. Time to... Time to stop playing games. And go for the attack. Really, in this type of position, it feels like uh, black is so safe. Like they managed to stop our pawn push and... The king is, you know, just chilling. But he can instantly be getting made at. Which is what uh, makes me love this variation, despite the computer thinking it's like nothing special. I just find it so difficult to play as black from like a human perspective. Like, imagine this is coming. If you don't take the pawn g7. And if you take, like I'm playing queen h6 anyways. Don't make the mistake to take, as he may run away. Maybe you have rook g7 there. Takes. Nah, that's like uh, not good enough. He's getting a little bit uh, too horny with that. Uh, we just want to take. And uh, bring the queen. 
King F7. I can maybe check. The thing is, I don't need to see everything until checkmate here. It is pretty clear that his king is going to be on the run and uh, we're going to be getting at least enough compensation for like a perpetual or whatever. If we don't, it's, I think, pretty unlucky. But yeah, F6, I think, easy, easily collapsing. How do you defend on Queen H6? You don't. <laughs> so, okay, look at this. Three moves ago, you thought your YouTuber is completely insane, he has no attack, he's just gonna be making a fool out of himself once again? Three moves later, he's absolutely busted. Okay, this is the hidden potential of the Juba Valander. You didn't know what I'm talking about, like what knight sacrifice is this crazy guy mentioning? I'm telling you. This is absolutely devastating. We'll check now this is just forced mate you can try to pause the video and find it uh this and easy pre-movable mate on f7 uh all right so first things first uh yeah you can see like by the bar it's a plus five completely winning let's try to find the move first so i think it would have been queen h6 and then Ah, I think I'm starting to get it. I think you don't need to rush. Like, he has no threats. I think maybe instead of doing this and kind of blocking your pieces, maybe it's clever to do this, threatening both rook g7 and rook e6. Yeah, rook g6, crashing move. See how huge of a difference this plays out? Like, if you rush and check, like, a monkey, it's only plus one. You play cold-blooded move, like, uh, you know, a decent player. It's resignable. So, uh, in fact, let me just very qu quickly show you a game that I had on the main account uh, using this very specific idea. Okay, so this is a game that I had in the title Tuesday. We had the same structure, opponent played h5, and we did our thing. He played, uh, yeah, what computer thinks is best. He got a very tough opening, despite him being uh, quite lower rated than me in this game. I play an IG3, you already know what your boy is setting up. And okay, this was a bit of a strange plan. Uh, I can take a pawn, but no, I don't want a free pawn, I want the checkmate. Why would you take, you know, like a little bit when you can get the whole kick? No, I'm playing 92. He went a5, perhaps he had to find c5 here to like get a good game. But after this, I think he's pretty much done. I'm playing c3 to kind of prophylactic move. I'm dodging the potential attack and now here the party begins. Knight takes on h5. And look, the computer thinks I'm insane. Yeah, like, look at the bar. But when you play him e5, oops, black just has no moves. It goes to zero, but I think the position is just really bad. Stronger engine, well, stronger engine would realize. So knight g3 takes knight plants on f6. Guess what? I did exactly that. And he had nothing to do but look at how I'm doing it, you know? Queen comes. I'm threatening mate. You can never take the knight because I'm getting like even crazier attack. Like rook coming in and mate. Move there, but okay, I can play anything. I just pick up the bishop. He's threatening... Uh g6 he took that pawn like oh let me take a pawn my king is like totally safe i do this threatening queen f7 he went there bishop g5 threatening monster fork no way to avoid it because uh, all of these squares are uh, covered went king d8 and i uh, went for checkmate so in my opinion this is a very important game that pretty much just creates a blueprint on how you can genuinely crash this uh, h5 structure, which is one of the main reasons I think why people uh, don't play f3 that often at the top level here and they prefer like the knight f3 e5 approach. I think f3 is clearly underrated, so with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody getting another game. Let's open up with d4 and... Let's see what opponent has in mind for us. Okay, we see another d5. 
Now begin with the knight, very important. Whenever you are planning to play the Jubava London, start with the knight. Playing bishop to f4 first would not be so great, especially because of such ideas. All right, like a move uh, such as c5 makes it pretty much impossible to get another Jubava London because bishop to f4 allows cd4 and we generally want to have a pawn on b4. Therefore, you need to use your memory. Okay, I'm not, uh, it's not very often that I'm asking for such, uh, you know, inappropriate uh, things, but you need to remember e4. Very important and strong move. Since cd4, queen d4 instantly better for white, pawn on d5 is under pressure and he plays that. Uh, instead of this, it is better for them to go d takes on e4. And after d takes on e4, we have d5, which pretty much is just saying that, okay, you are not going to be developing the knight onto c6. And the pawn on e4 is going to be a constant target. We're generally going to be winning it back and keep a space advantage. After cd4, however, you want to go queen d4. Typical mistake here, knight takes on d5, and then your knight uh, enters like a pretty funny journey. Uh, so, important to take it back with a queen. And since there is just such overwhelming pressure over the d5 pawn, he has to go to e4. Allowing queen takes on d8, leading to a very favorable endgame. If you don't understand uh, why that is a favorable endgame, you need to really watch this uh, <laughs> this game. Hopefully, I'm not gonna mess things up. So important to take, and I think 94 is completely okay, but I kind of remember that even better. It's bishop f4. So you know, stop e5 and uh, prioritize castling long. The key idea in these type of end games is that if black is able to hide with the king on c7 and then just develop like nothing has happened, the positions are pretty equal. But when king is not getting access to the c7 square, usually this snowballs super hard in white's favor. Usually computer evaluates these like plus one, plus two. Um, I'm going to show you like more examples uh, how you can get these positions after the game. Uh, okay, he plays f5, logical move defending. I'm going to castle with tempo. And I'm not going to be a crybaby and uh, be concerned about the e5 pawn. But you have a very kind of nice instructive idea. Unless he plays king e8. King e8, I think, loses on the spot. He has to like block with a piece in order to survive a bit longer. Uh, but yeah, the idea that I kind of uh, wanted to uh, bring up to your attention is that we can play the move pawn to f3. Now, after pawn to f3, we're threatening to take and open up the position in our favor and pretty much he is forced to take. We take it back with a knight and then despite being down a pawn, we have very easy development. Imagine like, let's say a uh, bishop could go to c4, a rook can go to e1. 95, 9, g5 type of ideas. It is essentially gonna be a game over, I think. So f3 very strong. Now, before you play f3, which you're sure it's a good move, you wanna look for tactics, okay? This is pretty much like uh, you're trying to drive a car without paying attention to the traffic rules. Yeah, no, it's like, sure, you gotta watch out for the steering wheel and all that, but you need to have your eyes open, okay? And you have your eyes open by looking for the tactics. Tactic would be, okay, we realize there is pin piece. So you want to put PP on the PP. You can do that with a move like bishop to b5, saying, okay, once this gets played, we have threat to play. Bishop b8 and take. But on bishop b5, maybe knight c6. Takes, takes, and we don't have an immediate way to uh, increase the pressure. So then you should be at least considering takes and bishop e5. Before you get too excited thinking that we are just crashing, remember he has defensive move, knight f6. By the way, funny move that uh, just came to my mind. I think computer would really like g4 additionally. Because <laughs> fg4, knight e4, 
and also yeah i think there are other ideas if we do the same we'll have g5 at the end i'll show you after the game but i'm gonna stick with simple move for now f3 by far the key takeaway in the structure take you with a knight and boom already 95 can be devastating if he is not careful this ends the game by the way just saying because then 95 happens and bishop b5 so he has to play like knight there but okay knight f6 okay knight c6 reasonable i may want to go 95 anyways even though we are allowing a trade he is just kind of getting uh, too exposed. So I like that. No need to hope for cheap tricks with like knight g5. I think he has king e8. Even though that has to be still much better. After say bishop c4. Rook e1. So yeah. Any move I think it's good. I just like knight e5. Because it kind of uh, clarifies things. And he has a hard time developing. I think he's very tempted to take and play knight f6, which is a blunder. Because you tend to, you know, want to develop your pieces. But you can think about that position because white has a winning blow. Uh, assuming you pause the video, uh, the point is after knight takes knight f6, we have bishop takes. And I don't think he has a way to deal with bishop to b5. And finally, we're going to be winning the pin bishop. Yeah, knight f6 allows uh, knight f7 here, so he has to, like, really take the knight. I don't really know why he's spending that much time for. Uh, yeah, has to take. And expecting this move, yeah? I, I, I could have bet my inexistent house that he's going to be playing knight f6, just because it's such a natural move. In fact, perhaps it's a bit better to do king e8, but he has, like, such an ugly position after knight e5. Look, we are down a pawn, but he's playing down three pieces, so... I let you do the math. Uh, knight of six, just gonna stick with uh, what I've mentioned, and boom, bishop b5, game over. This is pretty much the advantage of having played f3 there to open up lines for your pieces. Oh, there is this check that I missed. Maybe I'm uh, speaking a little bit too soon, <laughs> but uh, no, I don't think that's gonna help him. It's, you know, it's like a check. You check the guy, you feel good for a move, and then you resign. Luckily, it's that type of situation. So, uh, yeah, just going to pick up the bishop onto the next move. He cannot really do much to stay alive here. It's threatening discovery. want to bring my last piece into the game. want to go 95, uh, pressure e7. I think we start rook e1, bringing uh, one more piece. And rook e8 uh, can probably uh, be refuted by either knight d5 or takes. Both move look rather juicy. Uh, yeah, really, the rest should be I think pretty pretty simple. It is such a position where we have the extra piece, but we also keep the attack. You know, like sometimes the situation is <laughs> more double-edged when at least he gets something. Uh, for for the piece, but no, it's it's a very sad situation. Also getting forked, uh, forked double attack. I don't know. I don't know what you guys name these things. I'm just gonna take the rook and uh, pick up the pawn. And next, I'm just gonna try to exchange everything. But we don't really get the chance since he just resigned. So, okay, key takeaway. Remember to. Deal with c5 in this position. Okay, you're feeling that there is no way to get the normal Jabavalon kind of stuff. This would get kind of weird. Uh, by elimination, remember there is e4. But things get even better. Because if your opponent is not careful and plays the best move and follows it up with e6, you have one of the most stunning traps that I have ever seen. Which is bishop to b5. Check. Bishop to d7. And now we can go pawn takes on e6. And when they take your bishop, you have intermediate move. Pawn takes on f7. So, in order to not lose the queen, they need to go king e7. And if you take promoting queen, he can go for the trade and then take your queen. 
and that's kind of unclear. But instead, you can promote to a knight. If you don't have auto queen on. Imagine this is a knight, that's check, he has to take, and then you get bishop g5. And you get a free win. So that's uh, all there is about c5 for now. Uh, I expect it to be pretty rare in your games, but um, definitely annoying when it happens. So with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody getting another game with the white pieces. Let's open it up with d4 and hopefully we're going to be getting a normal game, but okay. My opponent goes for the very early c5, which is also known as the Benoni. Against this move, you can pretty much uh, play a number of things. I do believe that dc5 is quite interesting despite uh, not being the uh, optimal move. I'm going to stick with very principal play right now by playing d5. Uh, I just wanted to kind of clarify that, uh, well, playing knight to c3 would not be so great just because of cd4 and uh, then uh, we're not going to be getting the same positions just because uh, our important pawn center is demolished. So very important, you really want to keep the pawn center and uh, despite the fact that this is, let's say, not the kind of uh, really pure heart Jobavalon type of gameplay that, uh, in fact, you uh, were looking for. It is still something uh, that you really need to be aware of, as uh, you know, there are decent chances that sooner or later you will have to deal with uh, such things. No point in playing d6. Now I'm gonna go for uh, e4. Could also play knight c3, could also play c4. I think the, go the golden rule to remember in such positions is that uh, we're not going to be playing uh, kind of like the universal approach of trying to go full center mode. Because it's even better, I believe, to have the knight onto c3. And that may appear strange at first, just because uh, why wouldn't you like to have another pawn there? Well, in this structure, it is all about the c4 square. Why that? Well, at some point, uh, we have ideas to maneuver the knight. And the knight is just going to be incredibly uh, well placed there. It's just uh, like you're sitting on top of the Eiffel Tower. You can see everything. Okay, so I was just defending the pawn. Uh, key rule to remember, always answer a6 with a4. Um, the pretty much only thing that can get out of control whenever you're dealing with this is if he gets to play b5, it is very kind of nasty. It's going to be very unpleasant to deal with. So as I uh, mentioned, a6, you just play a4 and uh, yeah, you're done with b5 uh, for good. And then you just develop. I'm going to do knight f3. Some people like to throw in h3 just so that uh, they avoid uh, the bishop pin. I don't think that's a problem. So, I'm just going to start uh, with the knight. Gives of bishop g4, we're happy to cash in the bishop pair and play that type of position. And here we have an interesting choice on uh, how to develop the light square bishop, because uh, the game is going to be pretty much uh, such of a positional nature, uh, meaning that, okay, we just need to move this bishop somewhere on this diagonal, and then castle. But we have e2, d3, or c4. And I did a little bit of digging in these positions and I figured out that c4 is kind of very effective. Uh, even though it may potentially look like the bishop is sort of staring in our own pawn, the bishop actually plays a huge role if you try to understand what is sort of black's main idea. So in order to get any counterplay, they need to deliver a pawn break. Okay, black needs to either make b5 work uh, which uh, clearly we have gotten a pretty uh, decent uh, uh, grip of, or they can play with e6. And the bishop on c4 is specifically aimed to just discourage them from playing e6. So now you know, <laughs> I'm just going to be castling. And uh, here I would be expecting bishop g4. Knight bd7 is, I think, typical mistake. Uh, I mean... It's a playable move, it's just that I do believe uh, because of the lack of space, 
Black really needs to trade at least a pair of minor pieces so that they can move around easily, you know, it's... Whenever you're playing uh, this kind of structure, like the Benoni, it feels like you just have a tiny apartment that is full of furniture and you barely have any room to move around. Uh, so that's why, you know, you just gotta get rid of some of the furniture. Uh, so um, he needs to go for the uh, trade, in my humble opinion. Uh, and there we have it, bishop to g4. I'm gonna instantly uh, question this bishop, just a very typical idea in general, whenever one of uh, your opponent's bishops is uh, kind of looming around your knight, uh, he, you just wanna, you know, it's like somebody is staying in front of your house for no reason, like a stranger. It's kind of suspicious, no? You just wanna get rid of the situation as soon as you can, or at least clarify it. So, I'm gonna go h3, and okay, he goes back. That was not something that I was really expecting because you remember the whole furniture thing and uh, well, how are we going to punish this? We're not. <laughs> We're just going to continue development. Very important. Uh, bishop to f4. Okay, bishop to d7. Looks like he's preparing b5, but notice that after a, b, he cannot recapture because of the pin along the a file. So j just look at this. You know, it is really like the perfect picture of living in a one-room apartment, but for some reason having five different tables. I don't know why would you do that. So he plays rook to e8. We have a choice. I can do rook to e1, but with his last move, it's kind of hinting towards that uh, maybe he's going to push. I don't think he can really push in good conditions, but we can also try to be a little bit more aggressive considering a move like e5. Usually, whenever you can play something like e5, that is just going to be kind of like a stunning move in this structure. Uh, pretty much uh, opening up the position in like two different ways where uh, white is just crashing. So I'm going to play it. Okay. He's pretty much forced to take and we take with a knight. I think he's, uh, the knight goes. We have a nice uh, little, uh, you know, square on h2 for the bishop. Uh, he does that. We're going there. Now the knight is uh, really vulnerable. So... You can even go ahead and pause the video, find a winning move for white, if uh, if you may. Uh, because there's like a lot of action going with his pawns, but more so uh, the knight is now sitting on a pretty vulnerable uh, position, on a really like kind of mind square, uh, if, you, if you want, uh, because you can play a move like g4. And I know like a lot of you may be wondering, g4? Just like weakening our king. Yeah, but if you think about it, every single one of your opponent's pieces is sitting on the first two lines. So you can really get away with a more aggressive move like g4, especially when it's winning a piece. However, he takes uh, on e5, so g4 now wouldn't be uh, making any sense because the knight has these two squares. It's just going to take back. Taking with a knight. Uh, in case you're wondering, isn't it a good idea to take with a bishop trying to exchange his uh, fianchero so that the king is going to be weaker? I think that was a solid idea as well. I just like the knight better because we get uh, immediate uh, contact with the f7 square, you know? Imagine we play d6 and that could already be a disaster. So he plays d6 trying to sort of uh, open up the position. However, this is breaking a fundamental rule that says, uh, you know, the position will open up uh, for the side that is better developed. That is clearly us with our opponent. Not having any moves. Also, I'm not forced to like take immediate actions, even though I'm pretty sure we could get away with a move like this. But I'm just going to play Rook E1, which is uh, the so-called concept of letting him cook in his own sauce. Like he still has no moves. And if he decides to take, uh, I'm going to take back with any piece that is going to improve my situation. Uh, also, Rook E1 is very effective because after ED, my knight would have been attacked twice. So it's just kind of a nice little prophylactic move, making sure Every single one of our pieces is well defended, and uh, then we can take action. So he says, all right, I'm going to put pressure on d5. You already want to put your uh, big boy pants, because I do believe we have a tactic. So pause the video and try to find it on your own. Because because of that, knight on f7, I think it's a killer move. Hitting the queen, more so undermining e6. 
I think he's forced to recap, and now we have D takes on E6. Okay, it's gonna go Bishop takes on E6. And then what are you gonna be playing? I'm curious. There are, I think, two ways of dealing with this position. There is the simple uh, queen takes on d8, uh, deflecting the rook, and then picking up the piece uh, back with an extra pawn and obviously like crashing position. But uh, yeah, more so, I do believe that uh, when bishop takes uh, e6, we can simply take it with a bishop. Yes, take it with a bishop because if he is taking back with the rook, well, hello, the queen remains undefended. And this gives us the option that whenever the king goes back, uh, we would have had uh, bishop d6 uh, winning move. I'll show you after the game. Now, this is very tempting. This is tempting, but <laughs> I'm just going to take the uh, piece because then we take the rook. And then after we take the rook, the queen is undefended. This is like winning the jackpot pretty much. It's like getting the big lottery prize without even paying for it. It is We're just breaking into the casino. Just... When is the last time you've noticed something so brutal like this? You take a piece with check, he needs to move, you take this, and then you take another queen, and then the knight drops, and then just look at this. His knight is never able to move because he's completely pinned and paralyzed uh, by my queen. We have just witnessed total meltdown by my opponent in what I like to believe it was a perfect Benoni uh, game. Of course, uh, you know, we got a little bit of help by the main mistake of the game, which was uh, bishop to d7. He is definitely uh, supposed to take and then play the move knight bd7, creating a threat of this. Uh, but after queen d1, bishop f4, uh, rook e1, white is slightly better with the bishop pair and the nice pawn center. Uh, make sure to keep an eye on b5 and you should be fine. Uh, and really critical detail that I wanted to highlight uh, during the game was that after e6, I just played simple move, okay? Maybe we already have knight f7. Yeah, I think knight f7 was perhaps even here playable uh, just because of the fact that he cannot take with a rook. And if he takes with a king, the king is just going fishing with his bare hands. That is definitely a very risky operation. So perhaps rook e1, I just see the evil bar in the computer kind of liking this, but I'm not sure how you are supposed to really play. Maybe just a simple move like queen f3, I think it's viral sealing the deal you know kind of sealing the coffin for our opponent he cannot go anywhere the queen stopping the king rook d1 rook e1 just look at this imagine we play like rook d1 he moves queen somewhere he's about to like get mated in the middle of the board i mean not literally but uh yeah anything you play this is probably like a forced mate so there you have it that is mate on the board by the way so uh yeah i could have gone knight f7 I played rook e1 because I just feel like, you know, first of all, uh, I am a chicken and I cannot calculate more than two consecutive moves. But on the other hand, I think it's a very important concept here that, uh, well, e6 just sort of makes you feel like, ah, oh, he's attacking this. I need to do this. And then maybe he takes to the bishop. I trade queens. And you tend to go down this rabbit hole and all that happens is... Maybe you're gonna be slightly better after all of these. Yeah, we cannot argue there's a weak pawn. But look, now the knight has moves. The knight can develop. He's gonna finish development. It pretty much just becomes the game all of a sudden. So, no, he plays e6. You're like, dude, all of your pieces are literally sitting on uh, the first two uh, ranks. Knight is on the edge. I need to do nothing but improve my position. Just go rookie one. You know, just try to be a sigma male. Or girl. Or whatever. Saying, I'm just going to keep the tension. Because really one of the most underrated things that I have learned in chess is usually the weaker side will try to release tension. So you're the stronger side. Try to keep tension. Uh, tension meaning like uh, pawns like these when you have opportunity to take or he takes. If you can keep that, you're doing well. So, um... Yeah, I think that's pretty much a uh, key detail about this. Just before we go, I want to show you a very simple trap that gave me, uh, I believe, uh, over like 20 wins online against title players. 
So uh, it, it happens in like less than five moves, which is pretty funny and absurd. After knight f6, uh, knight c3, preparing e4, and after e6, that's what they play. We support the center. And here, black is supposed to do something like d6 or g6, you know, continue. I mean, not g6 because that's weird. They are supposed to play d6 and then perhaps take and g6. But a lot of people just go ahead and take. And they really overlook the fact that you have uh, e5 as a move. That eating the knight, and if they are going back, you can take on d5 with a massive advantage. Already almost winning. But it's funny that most people would try d4, thinking, oh, we get this knight trade, and then it's an interesting game. But white has the move queen e2. Hello? How are you going to defend against this check? There is really nothing else than bishop to e7, which is, you know... Uh, stepping into this and why is just winning a piece in the game. So I think that is pretty much a very decent uh, introduction to the Benoni, even though you are a Jubava London player and you're going to get that in uh, almost every single one of your games, you're still uh, going to get uh, hit by stuff like this or this uh, occasionally. So I wanted to have you covered uh, on both. So uh, with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. First of all, I want to congratulate you for deciding to increase the size of your penis by watching the whole video. But to clarify, this Jobava thing is a very serious opening. So serious to the point where I decided to hire Jobava Badur, the inventor himself of making a course together. But until that is ready and gives you to strengthen your knowledge even more, please feel free to check out the playlist that we already have on the channel. Enjoy!